If you think about the safest place on Earth, it is most likely that you will think about your bedroom, where the walls shield you from everything dark that is going on in the outside world. But sometimes, the walls are not thick enough. We have compiled the 10 different stories of people who suffered tragedy inside and outside of their homes. Individuals were found dead in the most heinous of ways. Neither their loved ones nor the investigators have any idea about who did it, when it happened, or the why for years. It took authorities decades to solve these mysteries, but closure to the families finally came in 2022. In our video, let us look into the 10 cold cases solved in 2022. Seventy-seven Girl Scout Murders For centuries, summer camp has been a part of the American experience. 1977, like previous years, offered a summer camp, with a population of 30,000 people and vast forest land in all directions. Mays County was an ideal location for a camp. Camp Scott, which the Girl Scouts had run since 1928, was two miles from Locust Grove, and 50 miles from the Girl Scout headquarters in Tulsa. On June 12, counselors greeted their campers at the latter. Michelle Hoffman, who graduated in 1977, spent the eighth summer as a counselor at Camp Scott. Eight-year-old Lori Lee Farmer, nine-year-old Michelle Heather Gus, and 10-year-old Doris Denise Milner departed on June 12, 1977, to spend two beautiful weeks at Camp Scott. When a 15-year-old noticed bashful Doris Milner amid the crowd, she remembered how frightening her first summer was. Milner assured the girl's mother not to worry as she waited among parents and 130 youngsters. The three daughters, Lori, Michelle, and Doris, kissed their parents farewell, not realizing they wouldn't ever see them again. The bus exited Highway 82 and drove onto Cookie Trail Road after roughly an hour of driving. While other campers dashed off to find their tents, Hoffman made it a point to accompany Doris to Kiowa Tent No. 8. Doris found close fellowship inside, adjacent to the restrooms in the kitchen. After a few songs and harmless chuckles, Doris had become great friends with Lori and Michelle. The three kids who had met for the first time earlier that day were given the same No. 8 tent at the campsite. The three appeared to have immediately formed a friendship with one another, unaware that the fatal tent would eternally bind them together through a sequence of horrific events. The next day, June 13, 1977, Counselor Cara Wilhite discovered a girl's body in her sleeping bag in the woods on her way to the shower. She found the victims and the following crime scene revealed the brutality of the murder. Doris was strangled, and Lori and Michelle were beaten to death. While news reports at 8 a.m. ranged from freak accidents to foul play, authorities on the site already knew the grim reality. Soon after, the remains of all three girls from tent number 8 were discovered on a trail leading to the showers, roughly 150 yards from their tent. The news sent shockwaves across the city, and the campers were sent home right away. The three kids had been brutally attacked and assaulted. It's unclear about the injuries those three kids received. However, it's evident that one of them was handled differently than the others and not packed into a sleeping bag. Meanwhile, buses returned all other campers to Tulsa at 2.15 p.m., allowing parents to breathe a sigh of relief. The authorities started their investigation with the counselor. While they were three of the quietest kids individually, Counselor Carla Wilhite claimed the tent was just as noisy and boisterous as others before evening. Their tent in the Kiowa unit was the furthest away from the camp counselor's tent and was partially concealed by the camp's showers. Due to poor weather, the campers, Lori, Doris, and Michelle 
went to their tents early in the evening. With enthusiasm running high on the first night of camp, all the girls remained awake all night and even indulged in some horseplay with their flashlights before retiring. One of the camp counselors said, The first day is tiring. The heat, the excitement, and the kids have worn you down. The continual noise of happy kids in the din of thunderstorms made it challenging to hear Lori, Doris, and Michelle scream for aid when the killer had broken into their tent and savagely beat them to death. There had been strange noises in the night, according to police interviews. At roughly 1.30 a.m., a counselor had checked for groaning sounds, but couldn't find the cause. A flashlight was flashed in a camper's face in tent number seven a half an hour later. At 3 a.m., one girl heard a scream, and another heard someone wailing, Mama, Mama. According to subsequent tests, the killer had assaulted, bludgeoned, and strangled the unfortunate girls whose only crime was being confined to a secluded tent. Between 2 and 3 a.m., a neighboring landowner heard quite a bit of traffic on the road near Camp Scott. Although the blood was all over the murder scene, the mattress and towels remained clean. Footprints of different sizes were discovered inside and outside the tent. The flashlight, duct tape, and cords were left behind. Authorities found a print on the glasses but were unable to identify it. Regrettably, another tragic event occurred less than two months before the killings, which should have prompted officials to increase security measures, but they did not. Someone had looted a camp counselor's cabin during an on-site training session, leaving a menacing message inside an empty donut box that said, We are on a mission to kill three girls in tent number eight. The authorities ignored the memo and dismissed it as a joke, a significant blunder on their behalf. The three girls would not have been slain if they had taken necessary measures. On June 16th, Sheriff Glenn Weaver claimed to have discovered the murder weapon, but District Attorney Sid Wise quickly rejected it. Then finally, police dogs found a flashlight battery, glasses that seemed to have been taken from camp, and a sketch done from the inputs of women who could match a guy named Gene Leroy Hart in a cave two miles from camp. The murderer was here, a neighboring cave's wall stated ominously. Goodbye, idiots. 77 617. Gene Leroy Hart had fled Mays County Jail in 1973 after being convicted of assaulting and abduction. Since then, Police think the Cherokee community had been harboring him. On April 6, 1978, authorities, along with the aid of 40 FBI agents, hunted him down in a Cherokee lodge with $1,250,000 in the bank. The manhunt was the biggest and longest in Oklahoma history. While Hart was hiding among Cherokees, members of the American Indian Movement said that Sheriff Weaver was looking for a scapegoat from their tribe in order to blame for the killings. Despite this, Hart was arrested and charged with three first-degree murders in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. The prosecution said Hart's spectacles were taken from the camp and that hair found on the duct tape looked like his during the trial, which lasted from March 19 to May 30, 1979. Meanwhile, the defense alleged that the glasses were obtained from Hart's earlier victims, with Hart admitting that Weaver placed the rest. Another suspect arose after waitress Dean Boyd testified that she saw a worried guy at her cafe, 15 miles from Camp Scott, on the morning of the killings. The guy, identified as William Stevens, was a convicted killer who had been observed on Camp Scott premises days before June 13th by an 11-year-old child. In 1989, three of the five probes and semen samples collected at the site matched Hart's DNA. The heinous deaths undoubtedly tarnished the camp's reputation, which led to its closure. A few years ago, evidence was re-examined and DNA analyzed, and the results are now being made public for the first time. Sheriff Mike Reed of Mays County has spent the last nine years investigating this case after Lori Farmer's parents begged him to do so. He claims that every DNA evidence has been accounted for, and there is no doubt in his view that Jane Leroy Hart is the killer, based on the evidence. 
Jean Leroy Hart was a 33-year-old Cherokee. In 1978, Hart was apprehended, prosecuted, and acquitted for the heinous crimes. Sheriff Reed claims that DNA evidence was not accessible to the jury in 1978, but that if it had been, Hart would have been found guilty. The facts, according to Reed, go much beyond DNA proof. He claims Hart was a classic serial killer convicted for kidnapping and assaulting two pregnant women 10 years before the Girl Scout murders. Hart was released after serving only two and a half years in jail for that crime. Sheriff Reed said there had been many conspiracy theories surrounding this case over the years, and he decided to look into it for one reason, the families. Jean Leroy Hart died in jail only a few months after being cleared of these murders. Sherry Farmer, Lori Farmer's mother, has lived with the consequences of this atrocity for 45 years. She claims that she and her husband are now at peace. It was a journey that neither of their parents would want on anyone. It's not the same as dying. It's not the same as losing their girls because they were killed. It was deliberate, and their daughters being killed as small girls is something they will never forget. Richard Gus, the father of one of the three victims, created the Oklahoma Victims' Bill of Rights in the state senate. He also assisted the establishment of the Oklahoma Crime Victims' Compensation Board. Sherry Farmer formed the Oklahoma branch of Parents of Murdered Children, a support organization. The legendary crime case of the Oklahoma Girl Scout killings has spawned countless documentaries and true crime shows over the last four decades. And finally, investigators have solved the case's most pondered issue of who killed the three Girl Scouts. The 2005 Mystery Death of the Ex-Beauty Queen Headlines were flashed saying that Bo Dukes and Ryan Duke had been detained in connection with the crime of a 2005 mystery death of an ex-beauty queen. Godwin, a forensic investigator, stepped into his office, went to his bookshelves, and took out a three-ring plastic binder. The words, Tara Grinstead Murder Book, were sprayed over the front in huge black letters. Godwin took it, sat down, and began reading it. His stomach began to churn he began to shake. He began reading through his cop notes, which he had written down. Godwin was tasked with uncovering the 2005 disappearance of a former beauty queen in Atlanta. Godwin was browsing the internet when a report from Osceola, Georgia appeared on his screen. Georgia was the state where our victim had resided in and where she was last seen. It was October 2005. The 30-year-old Tara Grinstead, a history teacher at the Irwin County High School in Osceola, Georgia, was reported missing. She did not show up for work, which prompted a welfare check and a missing persons report. Authorities checked her home at the time and found her keys. They noticed that her handbag was stolen, but her cell phone was still hooked to the charger next to her bed. Police didn't discover much wrong with Tara Grinstead's home, which was located just down the street from downtown Osceola. But they could find that the house was too clean, which made them suspect that something had happened. 34 hours passed since Grinstead's disappearance. First, the police did their welfare check, prompting Osceola Police Chief Billy Hancock to call the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Next, friends, family, neighbors, and law enforcement combed Osceola's region for clues, posted missing person flyers, and offered incentives for any information. They all believed that it was possible to find her. Police found that she was last seen at a party on October 22, 2005. On that Saturday night party, being Miss Tifton 1999, Grinstead assisted teenage competitors in preparing for a future beauty pageant. Tara had left beauty items out while helping girls and preparing them for the local sweet potato pageant, so her Halloween decorations were up at her home. However, outside Tara's residence, authorities discovered something that didn't appear to belong there. It was a latex glove in front of Grinstead's house. Fortunately, the latex glove was with fingerprints and DNA, but unfortunately, there was no match since Ryan Duke, who appeared in the headlines, had no criminal record during those days. 
but as a result, they had a better idea that something horrible had transpired. Grinstead's disappearance sparked speculations among Irwin County students that she had been murdered two weeks later. Bo and Ryan, who had both graduated from the institution, were accused of bragging to friends about killing the adored instructor and laughing about it. Unfortunately, following the leads was like chasing rabbits into a rabbit hole. As the case grew cold, the victim's sister, Anita Gaddis, hired Godwin as a private investigator in 2006, and he began researching the beauty queen's disappearance. He had questioned a large group of individuals in the 30-year-old's inner circle, as well as those on the perimeter for three years in the hopes of uncovering some information that might show him the truth. But unfortunately, Godwin's big break never materialized. He looked through all he had, but he was baffled since he couldn't find their names anywhere. On the other hand, Ryan Duke's friend Bo got further entangled with the law later on. He enrolled in the United States Army in 2006, and according to his counsel, he was sent to Iraq in 2009 and Afghanistan in 2012, and was even awarded several decorations for his service, including the Bronze Star. However, Bo and his wife pled guilty to stealing more than $150,000 from the Army in 2013, and he was sentenced to 27 months in federal prison and had to pay the federal government more than $134,000 in restitution. Years passed. Nothing could stop the ex-Beauty Queen case from turning cold until nearly 11 years later in August of 2016. Payne Lindsay, a brave podcast presenter, spoke about the abduction and murder of Miss Georgia Beauty Queen Tara Grinstead, a school teacher. The podcast provided fresh insight into the evidence while reigniting public interest in the case. My first goal was to find out what happened to Tara Grinstead. My second goal was to find out who had nothing to do with it. When police didn't get a break in the investigation until 2017, despite heightened scrutiny, Bo's ex-girlfriend, Brooke Sheridan, told GBI that Bo and Ryan spoke about murdering Grinstead and burning the body. Words are useless, but I'm burdened with the murder of Miss Grinstead, Ryan wrote. Ryan informed me that he had killed Tara Grinstead, Bo claimed in his confession, which was played for the jury. I asked him exactly what happened, and he said later that night, after everyone had gone home, he went through Fitzgerald and to her house, and because it was late, he used a card to enter through the front door, and he strangled her right there, and the vehicle hauled her corpse. He requested me to assist him in disposing of the body, and I obliged, Bo said. Grinstead's bare body took two days to burn to ash, according to Bo. The GBI confirmed on February 23, 2017, that they had received a tip that led to the arrest of Ryan Alexander Duke for the murder of Grinstead. Duke had attended Irwin County High School where Tara Grinstead worked as a teacher around three years before her abduction. Another arrest concerning Grinstead's disappearance was made public on March 3, 2017. Bo Dukes, a former classmate of Dukes who is not related to him, was charged with attempting to hide death, obstructing arrest, and tampering with evidence. Bo Dukes' trial began on March 19, 2019. On March 22, 2019, he was convicted guilty of his part in the murder cover-up and sentenced to 25 years in jail. The Georgia Supreme Court postponed Ryan Duke's murder trial until April 1, 2019, after Duke's lawyers claimed they were denied money for experts to testify on Duke's behalf unconstitutionally. Finally, on May 9, 2022, the trial began. During a February bond hearing, Ryan's attorney, Ashley Merchant, said the entire case was founded on an inconsistent statement from someone under the influence of narcotics. Maria Woods Harbor, Grinstead's lifelong and closest friend, believes that prosecutors are correct. Ryan killed her and Bo assisted. Harbor said she'll never understand how someone can live this long knowing what they've done and never say anything. 
Harbour remembers her memories with Grinstead regularly. They were childhood friends. Grinstead had the most lovely smile, and she aspired to be a school administrator and eventually a principal. She was attending night school to acquire specialty degree when she went missing. She made herself a pageant girl, not because she wanted to be the prettiest girl, not because she wanted people to think she was beautiful. She wanted, like, scholarship money. Grinstead competed in beauty pageants to win money for college scholarships. Grinstead won the Miss Tifton pageant in 1999, earning her a slot in the Miss Georgia competition that year. Her ultimate ambition was to win Miss Georgia, or at the very least go to Miss Georgia, Maria Woods Harbor recalls. Grinstead coached other young ladies in the Osceola region in the realm of pageants after she had stopped competing. For around six years, Tara Grinstead dated Marcus Harper, a former Osceola officer who joined the Army Rangers. Marcus was frequently abroad, and even though they had broken up by the fall of 2005, acquaintances believe that Tara was upset by the breakup. Bo was Grinstead's family friend. For 11 years, he did nothing and remained silent knowing the truth. He went about his business unconcerned about the anguish that he had caused Grinstead's family. He was well aware that she would never return. He made every effort to ensure that nothing remained of her. One selfish, terrible act has harmed countless others and forever altered their lives. However, this decade-long case was solved in 2022, bringing closure to the Grinstead family and allowing them to finally say farewell to Tara. This monstrous world did not deserve her after all. And if there's one thing that this case can teach us, is that there could still be monsters hidden around us that might show up when we least expect it. The 1986 Disappearance of a Minor Girl And I'm 35 years deep in this, trying to find my daughter. And I want my daughter back. I don't think I'm asking for much. This is the story of four-year-old Jessica Gutierrez from Lexington, South Carolina, who was kidnapped from her own bed early in the morning while her family slept and was later found out to be dead 35 years ago. But the question which remained all throughout was, where was the girl's body? and who was the man with the magic hat. Jessica was sleeping in a bedroom with her two sisters in her family's Lexington mobile home during the evening hours of June 5, 1986. An unknown intruder entered the house sometime between 11.30 p.m. and 9 a.m. on June 6 the following morning. The intruder apparently broke in through the living room window and removed the screen and curtains. The abductor then picked up Jessica from the bedroom and left the residence through the front door. Jessica's mother discovered the crime scene and her disappearance on the morning of June 6. Her six-year-old sister, Rebecca, said that Jessica had been taken by the man with the magic hat and the beard. Jessica was never heard from again. Just all of a sudden, you know, put your kids to bed and wake up one morning, and one of them's gone. You know, you don't understand it. And like I said, everything's happening like a whirlwind. Rebecca, now an adult, remembered seeing a man lift Jessica out of the bed and carry her away. She stated the man was able to do this without waking Jessica. Rebecca had been too frightened by what she saw to tell anyone until the next morning when Jessica was discovered missing. Just a few days before Jessica disappeared, her mother, Deborah, had broken up with her boyfriend and kicked him out of the house for alcohol use and what she described as possessive behavior. Was Deborah's ex-boyfriend the man with the magic hat and the beard? Did he abduct Jessica out of revenge, possessiveness, or jealousy? A lot of such questions arose instantly as the police heard Deborah's story. During the initial investigation, Deborah accused her ex-boyfriend of abducting Jessica but he said he had no idea where she was. The man was questioned repeatedly by police, but he was never charged. Jessica's father was ruled out as a suspect in the case as he had been living in California at the time of her abduction. Investigators worked for decades without success in tracking down a suspect, and eventually the case remained cold for a couple of decades. Despite a massive search, neither Jessica nor her killer was ever found. The case was then reviewed in 2008 and 2015. 
Lexington County Sheriff Jay Kuhn said investigators took a fresh look at the case this time. FBI special agents and analysts in the Child Abduction Rapid Deployment Team were brought in and helped review reports and interview more than 125 people. Because of the work we did coming together as a team, we were able to sort and connect more pieces of the puzzle about what happened to Jessica all those years ago, Sheriff Kuhn said. A video featuring an emotional interview with Jessica's mother Deborah was also circulated when the case was reopened. Due to these intensive efforts by law enforcement and the media and a fingerprint found on the window of Jessica's bedroom, the authorities were finally able to name a prime suspect in the kidnapping of Jessica. The man named was Thomas Eric McDowell, a friend of the family who was 27 in 1986 and had served time in a North Carolina prison for rape. His fingerprint was found on the window of Jessica's bedroom. It was the only fingerprint on the window as Deborah stated that she cleaned the windows every night. It turned out that in 1987, McDowell allegedly told a cellmate that he had kidnapped a girl in Lexington County and buried her body in a landfill there. He mentioned that he was wearing a tall cowboy hat at the time of the kidnapping. His cellmate told authorities about his statements, and when police confronted McDowell, he offered to confess if he got immunity from prosecution for the crime. The immunity was denied, and McDowell did not speak any further on the subject. In January 2022, McDowell was charged with murder, kidnapping, and first-degree burglary in Jessica's disappearance. Authorities haven't released much information about the evidence against him, but they did just reveal that McDowell lived in Lexington County in 1986 when Jessica disappeared. Deborah still believes her ex-boyfriend is somehow involved in the case. The ex-boyfriend and McDowell denied knowing each other, but Deborah says they met each other at a gathering several months before Jessica disappeared. Jessica's remains have never been found, but foul play is suspected in her case due to the circumstances involved. McDowell is being held on no bond at the Wake County Detention Center in Raleigh until he is extradited back to South Carolina. It is unclear at this time if he has retained an attorney, but the question which was asked at the start remained unanswered. Where is Jessica's body? The 1987 Multiple Murders by a Serial Killer Breaking news now on two cold case murders in Maryland and Virginia. Investigators say they've charged a man who they say killed two women years apart in Mount Rainier and Herndon. News Force Paul Wagner reports police say the suspect, who's already serving life in prison for murdering his girlfriend, has confessed to the killing. The appearance of E. Sober Adler's body field behind a hotel in suburban northern Virginia remained a terrifying mystery for 35 years. First, the 37-year-old lady was murdered at a parking lot near the Dulles Toll Road on Centerville Road in Herndon in 1987, where she had abandoned her car for unclear reason. Then construction workers discovered her naked and battered body behind a day's inn. According to an autopsy, her death was caused by a skull fracture and brain bleeding, caused by an unknown item. The murder was described as brutal and cold-hearted, but it wasn't the only homicide in Fairfax County to follow that pattern. Jennifer Landry, 19, was discovered in August 2002 in Randolph, Massachusetts. She was apprehended in Washington, D.C. and carried to Mount Rainier, where she was slain, according to police. Both murders lacked a solution or apparent leads. Landry and sober parents' Adlers died before they learned what had happened to their daughters. Even though the killings occurred 15 years apart, they were all committed by the same person, a serial murderer who is still on the loose. And he wasn't through yet. Decades of investigation would finally come to an end. Helm resolved to unravel the riddle on his own, However, it was Charles W. Hellam who had a lengthy criminal career. He had an extensive criminal record dating back to a 13-year-old assault and battery arrest. In 2010 and 2017, Hellam wrote detectives in Prince George's County, but refused to talk with them. Finally, 
He admitted to killing Landry in August 2002 in the letters, and he hinted at another homicide that Fairfax County Cold Case Unit police were investigating. In a jail cell interview concerning the Landry case in 2021, Prince George's county investigators eventually got him to confess to that murder. He named Sober Adler his victim, offering facts that only the killer would know and could not be revealed to the public at publication. In mid-January 2022, Prince George's County Cold Case Unit investigators filed an arrest warrant for Hellam for the Landry murder, barely a week before Fairfax County indicted him for the Sober Adler murder. Fairfax County police were visibly relieved during the news conference following the indictment that they had solved the case with the help of Prince George's County investigators. However, Descano, the Commonwealth attorney for Fairfax County, stated that he will pursue a severe prosecution, yet another life sentence. The murder of Sober Adler in 1987 may have been brutal to predict, but what if Hellam's 1997 torture of Custis was a warning sign that could have been preventing the killings of Landry, Bentley, and any other unidentified victims? Toscano created a domestic violence section to deal exclusively with these sorts of crimes because of the increasing rise. One of the burning issues that many people wanted the investigators to address is why a man serving life in prison would admit to another murder. However, comprehending a serial killer is going to be a difficult task. There might be other victims, perhaps more women, who Helm killed but have yet to be discovered. Investigators must try to identify more probable Helm victims. In 2010 and 2017, Helm sent letters to law enforcement in Prince George's County indicating he had information on the Landry case, but he initially refused to speak to our detectives. Detectives didn't give up. They tried again to interview him in 2021, and this time he agreed. During that interview, he verbally confessed to killing Jennifer Landry and spoke about an unsolved case here in Fairfax. Davis stated at the news conference that police are looking into it. We now know that he was slain in 1987. In the year 2002, he had killed twice. So authorities in both Fairfax County and Prince George's County are going back to see if there are any other possibilities or if he's been engaged in any other killings or crimes. In the killing of Patricia Bentley, a 37-year-old mother discovered strangled in her Chantilly, Virginia home in 2002, Charles Hellam, 52, is presently serving a life term in a Virginia state prison. Hellam has been accused of the murders of Jennifer Landry in Mount Rainier, Maryland, in 2002, and Ige Sober Adler in Herndon, Virginia, in 1987, according to authorities. 2007 Murder of a Major Girl This is the story of an 18-year-old Anita Nutsen, a student at Minot State University who was killed nearly 15 years ago. She was found stabbed to death in her apartment on June 4, 2007. Years later, after the case went cold, it was found out that her roommate was involved in the murder. Anita Nutson was living away from home, but she was close to their tightly knit family. She was known to be a person who would make anyone who talked to her feel comfortable and like the most important person in the world. On June 4, 2007, after not hearing from Anita, Gordon Nutson, her father, grew worried about his eldest daughter. He went to her apartment and found that Anita's car was parked outside and the apartment was locked. The apartment manager let him in the apartment where he discovered something which he would have never have wished for in his entire life. His daughter lying dead in a pool of her own blood. Nutson's father had called the police. In the yard outside her apartment, Anita's father showed police a sliced window screen that led to her bedroom window. When police arrived at the scene, they found Nutson had been st- to death in her bedroom, covered with a large house coat. She had been st- twice. Nothing appeared to have been taken from the apartment except for the removed window screen from the teen's bedroom and the murder weapon. A bloody knife had been left behind in the sink. A few years later, Anita's death was followed by another tragedy in the Nutson family. This time, it was their brother Daniel. What haunts me most about the death of my sister is that whoever killed also took the life of my brother that very day, Anna Nutson, Anita's sister, said. 
She said that after Anita was killed, their brother was never the same. He died by suicide in 2013. I don't know that I ever met anybody that did not like her. She was that type of person. If you were an underdog, she was befriending you. She was always there for whoever needed a friend. The case captured national attention and billboards featuring Knutson had been posted around the area for years in an effort to assist in finding her killer. But the killer would not be found until 15 years after the death of Anita Knutson. For more than a decade after Anita's murder, there was no person of interest announced. There was little evidence and a murder victim with no justice. But four years later, a break was made. The police tried to actively investigate Anita's case for the past few years, and finally, with the help of a show called Cold Justice, they were able to move forward and regain focus on the case. Due to resources, logistics, planning, and experts, the show was able to provide, and police were able to obtain an arrest warrant. The Minot Police Department later said that Nicole Rice, 34 years old, was in custody in relation to Anita's murder. Rice was at work on Minot Air Force Base as a civilian when she was arrested. At a press conference, police said they weren't able to share details of the break that led to Rice's arrest, but would release more information at a later date. Rice, who was Nutson's roommate at the time of her death, is charged with murder, which is a double-A felony and is being held at the Ward County Jail. There were never enough to arrest her, but I would say she was always a person of interest in the case, said the police chief, John Klug. Unnerving to know that somebody is out there that murdered somebody, and in this case, there was not one person that had anything bad to say about Anita. So, to me, this was a young girl with a great future that was taken away from her family way too soon. Rice made her initial appearance by video at the Ward County Courthouse. The judge set Rice's bond at a $250,000 surety bond. On April 21, 2022, Rice will be back in court for her preliminary hearing and arraignment. The authorities claim that the turning point in this case was just really trying to pull all the information together and put it in an order that made sense. As they said, a lot of information was information that they had. It just took a little bit of refocusing and a lot of paying attention to the finer details. My heart goes out to the family. I wish we could have solved this sooner. But at the same time, I am glad to say that we have the person responsible for the murder of Anita Knutson in custody, said Chief John Klug while finally closing this case. The 1964 Case of a Pennsylvania Girl The tragic story began on the morning of March 18, 1964. Marie Chivarella was a quiet girl from Hazleton, Pennsylvania, who enjoyed playing the organ and aspired to be a nun. One day, she set out to bring some canned goods to her teacher at St. Joseph's Parochial School. She then later planned to attend the morning mass, but Chivarella never made it back. She was last seen walking east on West 4th Street at 8.10 a.m. Reports claim that on the cold morning of March 18th, while Maurice was on her way back to school, she was asked by the neighbors to come up and get warm. But Maurice refused as she had to get back to her teacher with the goods. Neither the neighbors nor Maurice could have anticipated that from that moment, Maurice and her obedience would be history for the next five and a half decades. Somewhere along her way, she crossed paths with evil. At approximately 1 p.m. the same day, a man noticed what looked like a large doll in a coal mining waste pit. When he looked closer, the doll was actually Maurice Chivarella. Her body was discovered north of Route 309 in Hazel Township, close to the Hazelton Airport. The investigation revealed that Maurice was physically and sexually assaulted, murdered, and left at the scene with all of her clothing and personal belongings. The discovery of her body shocked the entire Hazleton community. It was a heartbreak that was felt by everyone in the town, especially by the children. Children who were Maurice's age started to be afraid while they were alone or unescorted. The case changed the way that people lived and how they approached their children's safety in the town. It didn't take long for the Pennsylvania State Police to begin their investigative efforts, which would ultimately last for decades. 
The authorities did not know that in this case, to even get a lead to work on, it would take years of grinding and scanning through databases. There were no leads or suspects immediately after the killing. The police could not retrieve any useful evidence from Maurice's body, which could lead them to her killer. They had no idea that it would take them over 50 years to find a single lead. In 2007, investigators were able to develop a DNA profile of the suspect from fluids left on Chivarella's jacket, but the DNA didn't match any criminals in their system. They checked the database monthly against all other criminals that had DNA in the system, but there was no successful match. Then, in 2019, police tried a different approach and uploaded the DNA from Chivarella's jacket to the genealogical database. This time, there was a match, but to what appeared to be a very distant relative. The DNA match was insufficient to get the relative into custody or charge him with murder. To generate public interest and garner leads in the case in 2018, Pennsylvania State Police used a technology provided by Parabon Nano Labs to generate a snapshot phenotype facial prediction of the suspect from his DNA. The technology generated possible photos of the suspect at three different ages of life, 25, 40, and 60. The pictures generated were released in the public domain, but unfortunately no witnesses came out with any leads that could lead to Maurice's killer. The DNA that was developed by the Pennsylvania State Police Lab was limited to certain chromosomes. But in 2020, it was learned that additional chromosomes could be discovered to form a DNA strand. The killer's profile is currently at the Pennsylvania State Police Lab and we're awaiting results shortly. This was at a time when even Maurice's parents had died. They did not live long enough to see what would unfold in Maurice's mystery ahead. Her siblings had said that her parents never sought revenge or punishment for their daughter's killer. They just wanted justice, but they did not make it alive to the other end of this investigation. Finally, in 2020, the police got help from an unlikely source. An 18-year-old named Eric Schubert emailed the department and offered to build out a family tree. He had volunteered with other cold cases before, and the police accepted his help, since Eric was known as a hard-working boy and a genius genealogy wizard. Schubert identified a number of family members, many of whom voluntarily shared their DNA with the police. The family tree eventually led the police to Maurice Chivarella's killer, James Paul Forte. Forte was 22 years of age back then, and he had a criminal history of sexual assaults prior to Chivarella's killing. Unfortunately, police could not prosecute Forte because he had already died in 1980 and the cause of his death had been a heart attack. Police exhumed his body in January 2022, and they found out a month later his DNA was a match to the fluids left on Chivarella's jacket. This information was released to the press in a press conference by Pennsylvania police, which lasted for more than an hour. For Chivarella's surviving family, the news was bittersweet. Her sister Carmen Marie Radke stated that her family will always feel the emptiness and the sorrow of Maurice's absence. She added further that they will continue to ask themselves what would have been or could have been done on that fateful day. Her family also went ahead and praised the persistent effort of Pennsylvania State Police, because of which now they have gotten closure and a sense of being at peace with Maurice's murder. The 1980 New York Woman Murder it was March 21, 1980. 20-year-old Eve Wilkowitz, a secretary at the Macmillan Publishing House in Manhattan, went out for dinner and a movie in Manhattan with her boyfriend, Jack Dempsey. After an exhausting day, Eve asked her boyfriend to wake her up in time to catch the 12.35 train back to Bayshore, Long Island, when they had returned to Dempsey's house. But unfortunately, she never made it back. Eve's roommate, Robert Grogan, realized Eve had not come home during the early morning hours of March 23, 1980. He'd report her missing a few hours later. Robert told the police that previously Eve had voiced anxiety to him that she was being followed on her walks from the station to home. Hence, Eve generally chose to take a taxi from the station to her residence. But on the day that she went missing, she preferred to walk home from the train station for about 10 minutes. 
and the police suspected that she was taken during that period. On March 25th, Eve's body was discovered when a lady observed a barefoot person in her neighbor's yard. Eve was dressed in blue trousers and a top with rope marks on her wrist, indicating that she had been held hostage for three days, which means Eve did take her train on March 22nd. Eve's shoes and socks were never discovered. According to the evidence, she was abused and then later strangled to death. The FBI created an abstract profile for Eve's killer in 1981. Her assailant was thought to be a Caucasian male between the ages of 19 and 30, who drove an old but well-maintained vehicle. This person is likewise said to have resided in Eve's neighborhood at her death. Eve's lawsuit was abandoned eventually as no new leads turned up. It remained an unsolved crime for more than four decades as the investigation went cold. But now, 42 years later, Eve's sister, Irene Wilkowitz, has finally received an answer to a question that she had been wondering about for years. All about who might have murdered her sister. 42 years afraid all the time that I was going to be killed. The whole case changed when a DNA sample from the initial murder scene led to a member of the Rice family, whose DNA had been published on a public genealogy website. As a result, Long Island police had finally solved a 42-year-old case assault and murder. Thanks to breakthroughs in DNA testing and information from a genealogical website. However, the culprit is already dead and died of natural causes. Herbert Rice, who died of a disease in 1991, allegedly assaulted Eve. It happened when 20-year-old Eve walked home from a train station in Bayshore on March 22, 1980. Rice assaulted her and then strangled her. Irene Wilkowitz, Eve's sister, thanked the police and recounted through tears the moment officers arrived with the message, we've identified the individual responsible for Eve's death. The 1993 Gilroy murder of an unknown victim June 1993, Pacheco Pass Road and Pacheco Pass Highway for vehicles in or around Gilroy and San Jose, the highway offers access to Interstate 5 toward Southern California. This was exactly where the corpse of an unknown lady was found. Police went to the spot and tried to identify the victim, but they couldn't find her ID. Detectives named her Pacheco Blue because of the color of her attire when she was discovered. So authorities referred to her as Jane Doe, Blue Pacheco, and they tried for years to identify the corpse, but the mystery continued. Suddenly, in 1994, an unknown person began submitting confessions in the form of letters to the Oregonian claiming responsibility for almost five killings on the West Coast. The letters came signed with a smiling expression every time. A year later, a guy surrendered to authorities after killing his girlfriend, Julie Winningham. The police identified him as the Happy Face Killer. He was a serial killer from Canada who pleaded guilty to murdering women in the United States. He was called the Happy Face Killer because he drew smiling faces in his letters to the media and government. In 2006, the Happy Face Killer wrote to the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office, saying he had murdered a lady and left her body at a turnaround on Highway 152 between Dinosaur Point Road and El Toro while already serving two life terms. He admitted to killing eight women in California, Washington, Oregon, Florida, and Wyoming between 1990 and 1995, as he was captured in 1995. The Happy Face Killer, a truck driver from Cheney, Washington, confessed to Santa Clara County officials that he picked up the lady at a truck stop on Interstate 5 near Corning. He claimed to have bought her lunch, and when they got intimate, he struck and drove for many hours with the body in the back of his truck before discarding it as he approached Gilroy. He allegedly recounted elements of the crime scene that only the killer would have known about, such as the flashlight discovered near the body. He pled guilty in 2007 and received his third life term, even though the woman's name was unknown. In 2007, the court met the happy face killer, Keith Hunter Jesperson. He pleaded guilty to the murder of Jane Doe. In Oregon, he is presently serving numerous life terms for the various killings. Well, I am responsible for the Happy Face killing, uh, which includes eight people in five states, 
and uh, there are uh, a lot of victims out there, and I'm very sorry. I, I didn't, for life, man, I can't understand myself why. Since the police couldn't find the victim's identity, the case turned cold. The DNA Doe Project is a nonprofit organization that employs volunteers to help identify unknown victims via DNA profiles of probable relatives. In 2019, the sheriff's office teamed up with the DNA Doe Project to investigate if DNA and genealogy might be utilized to solve a cold case. The project employed GEDmatch, a free genetic genealogy site that allows individuals to upload their DNA profiles and aid law enforcement in finding a victim's relative. Even though the relative was not a close match to the victim, this offered the project a head start, searching for more forebears. While the project was compiling a family tree, the sheriff's office contacted family members and requested DNA samples to aid in the investigation. The agency ultimately matched the victim's identity to a DNA sample on April 13th. The office had previously utilized forensic genealogy to identify criminals successfully, but this was the first time it had used it to identify a Jane Doe. Her cause of death was unknown, although she was considered dead for at least a week. After 29 years, the police found that the woman known only as Pacheco Blue had a name. She is Patricia Skypel of Colton from Oregon. Patricia Skypel, known to her family and friends as Patsy, was a mother of two children and a longtime resident of Colton, Oregon. Near Colton, a small town southeast of Portland, she worked as a nurse's assistant and in canneries. Patsy disappeared from her Malala home in 1992. For years, Patsy's family worried about where she disappeared and if she would ever return. Finally, her family was contacted by the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office last week to notify them of this discovery. For three decades, Gloria White, Patsy's sister, had wondered what happened to her sister, Patricia Skypel. So when the detective went to Patsy's house, the first thing her sister Gloria did was she looked at Patsy's photo and realized that she was gone forever. Gloria finally received a solution. Patsy has been missing for more than three decades. Her sister claimed Patsy had a fight with her husband and fled in the middle of the night. Patsy was 45 years old when she was killed. Did Patsy already know the happy face killer? Well, Gloria believes her sister accepted a trip from Jesperson, despite having no friends in the region or any other reason to visit Santa Clara County. So many questions are left unanswered in the case. Detectives must have said to themselves, it's going to be too difficult to solve, they won't pull it off. But owing to a law enforcement agency's cooperation with SCCSO, people were encouraged to upload to GEDmatch, which enabled the investigators and victim's family to get one step closer to solving the case. Gloria was hoping that the investigators could solve this long-standing mystery for her, and finally she was relieved when she knew what happened to her sister Patricia, a mystery haunting the family for decades. At the very least, Patsy's family will be at ease knowing what happened to her. Usually, because of the evasive nature of the killer, many cases turn cold. However, the 1993 Gilroy murder of an unknown victim is noteworthy because of the long time it took to crack the case. The 1990 Killing of a California Man Fontana is California's most prosperous city and the United States' fourth most prosperous city. But nonetheless, it receives a D-minus grade, indicating a significantly higher crime rate than the national average. According to official data, 11% of the city is extremely unsafe. The riskier side of the city includes the 32-year-old cold case, which shows how deadly Fontana can be. Mango Avenue in Fontana is where people lived peacefully until March 25, 1990. It was until the day John Carl Burkhart was found dead inside his home in Mango Avenue. Losing the physical functions of our body and having to rely on others for daily care is the biggest fear among older people. But our 71-year-old John Carl Burkhart was strong enough to exercise, visit his friend's place, and join his gang for breakfast, which is how Burkhart's friends found out something was not in order. Burkhardt's friends went to his home and found his body. He was 
victim multiple times and then his house was ransacked. The body had neither defensive wounds nor did it have bruises, which means that Burkhart knew his killer. Detectives acquired fingerprints and other evidence during the first inquiry, but could not definitively identify it using technology from the 1990s. Police said they followed up on all leads and studied all evidence, but could not find the culprit in this murder. After that, the case went cold for over a decade. Twelve years later, the police got a call from an anonymous lady claiming that she was at Burkhardt's home that fateful night and witnessed his murder. Michael Vance, age 36, was eventually identified as the individual who killed Burkhardt. She told the officers she went to Burkhardt's house with Vance to pick up a paycheck. Instead, Burkhardt and Vance began bickering over money inside, she claimed. She added that both got into an altercation over money owing to the suspect. Vance then went into the kitchen and stabbed the man multiple times with a steak knife. Before leaving Burkhardt's residence, the suspect and witness stole stuff. After the statement, Vance was brought in for an interview. During the interview, the suspect Vance denied knowing the victim, working for the victim, or being present at the apartment. But investigators were able to corroborate Vance's fingerprints on both the murder weapon and evidence acquired from inside the house, thanks to advances in contemporary technology. The case was forwarded to the San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office in September 2021, and Vance was charged with murder, voluntary manslaughter, and the use of a dangerous or lethal weapon. Vance pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter in April 2022. Now Vance is spending his term in state prison alongside another sentence that he is serving for a separate offense. According to the Fontana Police Department, the conviction of Vance put an end decades of police effort by detectives, cold case investigators, and the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. We hope that breaking the cold case should have somehow relieved the Burkhardt family and friends. The 1988 Murder of a 79-Year-Old Woman In 1988, church friends discovered Lucille Holtgren, 79, dead in her Northern California home sparking a decades-long search for the culprit. Authorities now claim to know who committed the crime, but it is too late for criminal justice. Lucille Holtgren's killer was caught by death before the law, but the Galt woman's final desperate deeds helped authorities solve her crime. On May 23, 1988, Galt police officers were summoned to the 500 block of Poplar Street, in response to a complaint of a lady found deceased in an apartment building. Two friends arrived at the woman's house to check on her after she failed to show up for church the day before. The two buddies had entered through the east side of the house through a slightly open sliding glass door. Holtgren, 79 years old, had noticeable bruises on her chest. However, there were no traces of forced entry into the house according to police. Instead, she had been stabbed and strangled, according to the investigation. She had been dead for two to five days when her friends discovered her. It was a heartbreaking conclusion to her beautiful life. Galt Police Chief Brian Kolonowski found that Holtgren moved to another location after Frank Holtgren's husband died in October 1987. She has lived in Galt for almost 25 years, having relocated from Ohio with her family. It turned out that detectives would be able to obtain all the evidence they required to solve the case. But it took more than 30 years for the technology to allow this to happen. The Sacramento County Crime Lab investigators got a lead earlier this year when they studied scratches from Holtgren's fingernails and body fluids from the crime scene bed linens, thanks to breakthroughs in technology. This case was solved because of the fingernails. Authorities claimed Bramble's DNA was on file from a 1992 assault case in San Joaquin County. As a result, he had to file an offender report. Officers were able to identify him as the suspect in the Holtgren murder because of this unrelated investigation. In this case, the fingernails were the key to solving this case. Bramble was a lifelong Galt resident and transient until his death in October 2011 from natural causes. He had lived for five or six years beneath a bridge near Highway 99. The police stated that they did not know the motivation. So much has changed in technology, 
but at the time, investigators did everything they could. It is one of those cases where DNA was just on the horizon to solve the decades-old cold case. Any criminal investigator's goal is to find the perpetrator. However, the story of how the crime is solved is sometimes much more compelling, whether it's through intense investigation or small coincidences. Thanks to the advancements in DNA technology and the investigating authorities who spent years to bring closure to the case and at least peace to the victims. What do you guys think about these decades-old cold cases that were solved in 2022? Let us know in the comments. Never forget to like our video if you have enjoyed it. Subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon to stay notified about our updates.